Look, the, the, the idea of this chat was, uh, I don't know about you guys, but we're pondering the idea of iPads. Uh, and so I put the message out in Google Plus to say if anyone wants to talk about this, um, it'd be nice to have a discussion. I know there are some people in the room who are looking at it and some people who have done it and all sorts of expertise levels. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a chat. Fair enough. Sounds good. Um, hi, Sue. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can now, Chris. Excellent. Nice to see you. Long time no see. I know. Quite a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Um, I might just, just quickly, before we start, you guys introduce yourself. We'll start left to right. So, uh, Ben, you can go first. And just tell everyone All who right. you are. Um, ben Jones, head teacher, teaching and learning at Marylands High School. Mm -hmm. And Jenny? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I guess I'm next, technically. Um, I'm Chris Fetcher. I teach at PLZ Sydney. I'm the technology integrator there and um, all things geekery. Jen? Um, I'm probably similar to you, except I'm at Epsom Primary School. I'm the ICT uh, leading teacher and I also do reading recovery, just to keep my hand in things. Um, we have now had our iPads for two years. We slipped over the two-year mark and um, have changed from then to now greatly. I'll bet, I'll bet. And uh, it's worth pointing out too that uh, Jenny's also on the Slide to Learn team. Correct? I always forget to say that. I'm a bad self-promoter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have lots of things to say on this topic, I would imagine. Uh, Mike? Yeah, uh, Mike Israel. I'm the IT manager at Max Grammar. So I'm your, your token um, IT geek here amongst all you educators. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you for having me. No worries. Uh, Paul? Okay. Um, Paul McMahon. I was formerly of Perth. Uh, I took a position over at the Australian International of Hong Kong. Um, roll forward. I, I'm now actually doing lots of things, but mostly for the day job. I work for 3P Learning up here in Asia, trying to promote their products. That's the Mathletics, Spellodrome, Reading Eggs, that sort of stuff that I know quite a few Aussie schools are quite familiar with. Um, yeah, which actually we're going to have some questions for you. Yeah, I, I bet you do. Which does actually bring me into the iPad uh, 4A, and, and they're just moving down the iPad path right now. Um, but I also run a very, very large conference here in Hong Kong. It's called the 21st Century Learning Conference in Hong Kong. And uh, we last year did a, a, a pre-conference on iPads, and we're running a second one this year on iPads. iPads are huge in Asia at the moment, so uh, that's why I'm hanging out in here. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uh, probably a little bit more of a, a hanger out or I'm uh, hoping to learn a lot from you guys. No worries. Good to have you. Simon? Hey, uh, Chris, I'm Simon Brown in Brisbane. I work for TAFE, Skills Tech TAFE. That's uh, all the tradies, so not an iPad in sight, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a lurker in this session. I'm helping to organise a conference at the Gold Coast in November, so Teaching and Learning with Vision conference. So uh, it'll be all things iPad there, but yeah. Cool. Thanks. No worries. And uh, Sue? Yeah, I'm Sue Bell. I'm originally from Melbourne and I've been living in Tassie for the past four years. Um, hence, I've got my scarf on and my woolies because it's pretty cold here. Um, I'm working at Morris Regional College on the e-learning coordinator there and I also teach digital media and we're talking about um, using one-to-one -one devices next year so I thought that you guys might have some something you can pass on, some information you might be able to pass on about um, deploying those kind of devices in the school. Yeah, I'm sure we'll all pick each other's brains. And uh, just joined us is Dan Ingvarsson. Hi, Dan. Hello, all. Uh, Dan Ingvarsson from uh, NSIP, um, the National Schools Interoperability Program. Um, I'm uh, known Chris for a while and uh, saw that he was putting this on, so I was interested to see what were the things that people uh, thought uh, were the important uh, headaches, and I, I enjoyed his pun. <laughs> Even if it did go to spam. <laughs> Excellent. And um, Dan and Sue, if you want to, no pressure, but if you want to, there's a, there's an app that you can add in here at the top of the screen called Hangout Lower Thirds, and you can just add your name at the bottom of the screen there if you want to. Uh, all right. Um, so, Jenny, I, I'm going to start with you because you've obviously got a lot of experience with this stuff um, in all sorts of areas. Do you just want to give us the, the, the state of the union with iPads in schools as far as your, or your take on it? 
Okay. Um, at the moment, we have our iPads in a one-to-one -one, uh, scenario in grade three and four level, and um, we started off being student managed. Now they've gone to school control managed to student managed. So there are various levels for different students. Uh, one size does not fit all anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, we have lots of different ways that the iPads are actually being looked after um, to suit the different students, to suit the different families, uh, to suit the various amounts of uh, internet access they may have at home or not have at home. So there are lots of variables. Um, the one size fits all just, just doesn't suit at our school at all. That's where we're up to at the moment. Whereas with our trial, we were in the trial at the start in 2010 and um, all students had full um, student management of the devices. Uh, they were given a hundred dollars iTunes card and a list of apps to put on there. Uh, we probably had about 40% who didn't have internet at home and they would at lunchtime do theirs at school. At that stage we had a lab. We no longer have a lab. We've uh, moved the lab out into the classroom so technology is everywhere. It's not locked away in a room, which is nice in a lot of ways. Um, so there are many laptops in trolleys, that sort of thing, so they can plug them up and sync or whatever they need to do when they need to. Um, majority of the charging is done at home. We don't have a cart for charging or syncing at this stage. We haven't invested in that sort of equipment because we've had the student managed and um, a lot of that's been done at home. Um, in, a, in an ideal world, they would be student managed. Yep. And um, all the syncing and charging is done at home out of the school's hands. Yeah, that seems like a, ultimately probably the best way to go, isn't it? Yes. Um, I'm going to just throw it over to... Do you guys mind if I can just kind of manage it like this? Otherwise, we'll all be sort of talking over each other. But, but if you've got something to add, please... Please jump in. Um, Dan, you, you do the interoperability in school stuff. Do you just want to have your say on this? Because I think your take on this is um, an interesting one. Well, I suspect <laughs> it will be. <laughs> well, people that, that, that have known me and, and uh, it was interesting, there's a, a number of people on the call that I've been on calls with over the, the, the recent uh, history. Um, uh, the, the interoperability program is about trying to do something uh, in a common way, so that we can we can reuse it, and uh, what we're kind of playing with at the moment is how can you create an environment where not only uh, do we think about the apps that are being used on iPad, but how those apps interact with the other uh, uh, software that we've got on online services, etc. And how does that link into what teachers currently use in their schools? Let's say they've got a Moodle or they've got some other learning management system or just a reporting system. Um, and how does that then link into your student management system? So that the, in a, in a, if I can paint a panacea, that uh, um, uh, we're, we're not there yet. So if, if I can paint a, a, a potential panacea, a, um, a teacher logs uh, into... Uh, an app and that they've just downloaded and they type in a little code and all of a sudden all their classes are here with all of their students and they are able to then uh, go back to a system they have in the school and the results from what students have been doing on the iPads is available to them in a kind of dashboard that gives them progress across a whole range of applications. Um, this might sound a little bit, you know, sort of fanciful, the way of gluing up not just the provisioning of the, the apps onto the devices, but the tracking and provisioning of what goes into those apps. Um, but there's work going on on this and for websites, for applications in the schools, for apps, um, along with a project that's called the, uh, the Shared Learning Collaborative in the, uh, in the US. So it's... Uh, it's work that's uh, it's progressing, and we've got a range of pilots that are that are mucking around with stuff in Australia as well. 
Is that is that the sort of thing you wanted, Chris? Yep, yep. That puts us in the picture. It, it, how does that work? Because if you're going to get apps to become interoperable, does, doesn't that rely on the person who develops the apps to accept mm. sort of interoperability standards? And with 160,000 apps in the App Store, that's never going to happen, right? Correct. It's never going to happen for 160,000 apps. But if you were to have a standard interface where the developer was able to point the app at a broker that was able to uh, understand a limited set of uh, queries on students, staff, classes and schools, yep. a group that is uh, being well defined and agreed across Australia, then you can do a lot of these, these, uh, these things. And as I said, uh, there, there's always the, the there are you know there are many steps to take, but if you are as a developer able to say, I have an API and I just call that API with a code and it will give me a list of students, right? Wherever wherever whichever app I've I've developed or right. list of teachers or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Okay. Um, I don't want to dominate this discussion, so you guys, please ask questions. I think too, jump in. Chris. I mean, I can jump in there. Um, you know, I think Dan, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're probably going to be targeting software developers who've already got a stake in the education market. They've already got a learning management system. It's web-based, and they're going, "Oh, well, gee, wouldn't it be great if our portal or our learning management system was now an app?" And so they're, all they've really got to do, they've got to be SIP compliant to start with, and then they're just porting that product to, to an app-based product. Is that, that's kind of what you're getting at, isn't it? It's kind of what we're getting at. There's, a slightly, there's one layer on top of it, which is a services layer on top of the, the data model that allows for lightweight queries rather than the heavyweight full interoperability framework that SIF offers. Okay. Um, and... There's multiple layers and multiple ways of these things joining up, and some, you know, we've got lots of different tools in the kit bag, so we, we haven't got a complete picture of what exactly to use when, and but we're we're certainly making uh, strides in that regard, um, and we'll be, we we uh, we certainly be going out to core vendors, so that the the key is that. You're not asking a vendor to make, write something that goes to Knox and this place and this place, this place and this place. You're writing something where the developer writes once, and the information that is that is used over the that that API configures the app for the teacher. So the teacher doesn't need to know what to do, how to do anything. Yeah, it's built into the app. Um, ben Jones just threw something in the chat there that was something I guess I was thinking as you were talking is, and he said, is it just me or is it ironic we're talking about learning management systems on a personalised learning device? Um, ben, you want to throw some fuel on that fire? Yeah, I, I just, um, if, if we look at where one-to-one -one has been going the last few months, well, years actually, really to be honest, is um, there was the push to the heavily managed one-to-one -one environment and I guess uh, probably I think it's the vendor's response. The hardware suppliers have come through with a piece of hardware that truly is personalised um, and there's nothing we can do about it. As much as we'd like to be able to manage them, we can't and that has its positives, I think, for our students and also negatives for our systems. But I, I just I wonder if it's ironic that we're trying to find this um, learning management system as a solution that we can't manage the hardware, which as... The, the nerds have, co have classically wanted to do, so they try to manage the learning through a system. Um, and I, I and being totally ironic, um, I, honest here, that my school is at the stage of we just we've just done a, a, with my team. My team have been using a professional learning device, and we are just starting to go down the road of student devices. So I'm being I'm gonna I'm just throwing something a ring there and a bit of a question to ask is why do we want to constrain it to a learning management system when it is a personalised device? So if I could, particularly for the the people who've been going down this road, I'd I'd love to hear your response to that question. Why is a learning management system so critical in a personalised learning device? Well, I'll I'll speak if no one else does. Um, uh, <laughs> there is, <laughs> um, there's lots of there's lots of reasons for it. Um, the amount of time for teachers to to to, to know where students are. The the basic line that we're 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 trying to push is 
we've got to follow the students now. We tried putting in big learning management systems and creating environments to replace classrooms. And I think everyone says we've moved on from there now. Um, now what we're trying to do is uh, is to enable a coordination of a much more dynamic ecosystem in, in such a way that it doesn't overwhelm the, uh, the teachers with work and enables a, uh, a, a, a an on-demand set of tools um, that can be used to build on what the teachers are doing. So what instead of isolated personal pieces that we're always just putting in and trying to tap into and all of that kind of stuff, the layer behind that that is supposed to assist in coordination in the way that we currently do for uh, our own accounts here when we link up you know between Twitter and this website and those kind of things that we can all do um, but um, with a co with that just one added tweak of how might the, this, the information being used make the job of the teacher using it simpler so I'm not saying we've got everything sorted. I'm saying that uh, we're certainly moving away from large industry scales LMSs to an information model that's built on an ecosystem. Right. Um, maybe just listen to a bit of that and agree with some and disagree with, with or probably need more information ready to respond to it. Um, may I flag, is LMS the word we want to use? Do we want to tie this level of thinking with what LMS brought us in the form of Moodle and Janison and other ab abhorrent systems that tied us to a <laughs> workflow. I think um, you know LMS or learning management. I guess is just you know it's just a title. It's just an umbrella or a catch-all for for that sort of idea. And I guess I sort of look at LMS as more as a place, almost like a meeting place or a place where you can aggregate. Um, or facilitate or, or, or just, you know, group together different learning elements. Um, you know, I don't sort of see that, like at our school, yeah, we have a learning management system, but it's really just a starting point. And, and if it's not working or it doesn't do what the teacher wants it to do, then they're quite free to jump off and start using Dropbox or, or Google Docs or whatever they, they want to use, whatever they feel most comfortable with. Um, and the learning management system is more just the starting point where it's almost like pointing to various other resources. So maybe that answers your question a little bit and makes the learning more personalised. Hmm. Um, for, for the people who aren't that, I mean, okay, I've got a couple of questions and, and I'll throw them out there. In, and one is about the use of... T okay, let me back up a step. First of all, I'm not presuming from the for a moment that when we say a tablet program, we're even talking about iPads. Um, I, I recognise that 99% of people are, but I'm wondering what are the alternatives out there? There's some pretty interesting looking stuff coming over the horizon from Windows. There's some really, I saw some, I was saying to Mike before we started, there's some fascinating stuff coming on board from Samsung now that does sort of text recognition with styluses and all that sort of stuff. But, um, I, I tend to think this is uh, kind of a bold new world where the hardware is just starting to go through the innovation phase now, and I don't really know where that's going to end up. Um, although, I quite as I say, I quite happily accept that 99% of currently iPads um, will remain that way. I don't know. So, question one and question two is: in a highly um, in an environment where these things are individual devices, how do you then deal with situations in the very younger years where it's not really appropriate? Like I'm talking kindergarten type ages. It's not really appropriate to give kids these in a one-to-one -one, uh, fashion uh, and yet they really don't lend themselves very nice to being shared from what I can tell and from what everyone tells me. Anyone got any thoughts on that? Well, why don't you see it as being appropriate for them to use it in a one-to-one -one fashion? I mean, I've got a three-year-old who's all over it at the moment, you know, and, uh, and certainly the experience of a few schools over here is that they have very much used them in a one-to-one -one fashion at the kindergarten level and they, they seem to work quite well down there. Now, clearly that's not, I mean, that's when I say one-to-one, -one, okay, we're not talking about a student-managed device then, are we? They're not taking them home at night and charging them and, and carrying them oh, back and forth to school. 
I, so it's not not one to one in that sense. No, no. But you're you're talking about a situation where there's a, an iPad per child, and yeah. every day the child gets the same iPad. Yeah, I've I've seen that. That's certainly something that has happened in quite a few of the schools uh, that I'm working in over here, and it seems to work quite well. We we have a difficulty. I know that uh, when Jenny was talking before, she was talking about uh, having the uh, the iTunes voucher cards, which every school in Asia would absolutely love if they could do it. But there is no mm -hmm. iTunes store in Hong Kong, of course. So. Um, yeah, the whole management is, is just a huge, huge issue over here. And um, I, I, one of the things that, that I back back to, Chris, one of the things that quite fascinates me is, uh, <laughs> and I, I think it's been a criticism of some of the schools that went down the road of the one-to-one -one when laptops came in, and that is that sometimes the cart's before the horse. Sometimes what you've got there is you've got this device, which everybody is rushing to use, and then they're basically running around saying, well, how do we get this to fit our educational outcomes that we're working towards? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've definitely dealt with quite a bit of that. And, uh, and certainly when I put then the, the vendor hat on and go in, we get a lot of that. And, you know, when you're talking before about the LMS and capturing data and that sort of stuff, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is quite difficult. And to have the interoperability between an experience that you have online that can be a really, really rich experience and really a lot of the apps that that a lot of the teachers use aren't such a rich experience, but they want that complete rich experience on the iPad, and and everybody's running to try and make it, and I, I'm not sure that we're quite there yet. But you know, like a lot of these things, it's great that people are experimenting, but I think we've got a bit of a way to go to get it right. The I, left brain. The left. Oh, sorry, um, you go, Jen. I think one of the common mistakes is with say using the iPads or something is trying to use it how you used to do things because the the iPad in particular is a completely different operating system. Uh, you use the device differently. You have different workflows with using it. And, and I think we shouldn't try and, well, how do we make this fit something we've already got? How do we make this fit with that? I think we need to use it as a new device in a new way and be doing new things with it. And um, Good comments. in some ways that's where one-to-ones fall down because um, some classes will get one to one and we've all got our iPad and now we're all going to do this on our iPad and so it becomes a teacher out the front and we've all got our devices. So in actual fact next year we're actually looking at not having one to one devices and perhaps having a pod of them in many classrooms and they'll be used in that way as an activity, this, this group are doing this with the iPads and this group are going to be doing this on laptops and these people might be using pen and paper and these kids might be building something with blocks. So it's not going to be the one-to-one -one where right, we've all got our iPads, let's open up Wordle or something, whatever, and like that. And I think we need to think of them as different devices, different operating systems, use them differently and not try and make them what we've already got. Can I just pose a question to you then, because that's something we, we're actually looking at at the moment. Be, um, because we don't want to go the one one to road, um, how do you plan to manage that? Because our big challenge is as soon as you log on to an iPad, it instantly customises itself to you. Um, so as soon as you've hit the browser and you've put in your certain details, that's it. That's effectively your iPad. And as soon as you hand that to another student, even if you haven't logged on, it's got your photos, it's got your personal data, uh, it's got video, it's got all sorts of evidence of learning that yep. is effectively now in the hands of another student. Angry um, Birds high scores. Yeah, and, and you know, there's obviously the, the low level of the Angry Birds, but there's the reality we deal with in schools every day of when there's the photo that suddenly gets turned into a um, mime and put up line with all sorts of commentary on it yeah. um, and that's the challenge we face and that's that's what I would love to understand how we can do that better because we've just come up with a kind of policy playing with stuff but I want to hear has anyone done this we've done something like that um, I might get shouted down but we actually um, bought a bunch of iPads for year 12s um, and the idea was you know that it was going to be like a, a supplementary device for them and that they could loan it from us, a bit like loaning a book from a library, um, for a month. And um, so they take it away, they can use it for a month, and as long as they've got an iCloud account, pretty much, you know, the photos, the documents, the apps, 
um, that they download and use. Um, you know, they'll be able to keep, even though they're giving the iPad back, and we just wipe it when we get it back. Um, we just make sure that they've backed everything up to their iCloud, and you know, maybe they can borrow another one, or they can buy one, or bring one from home, um, sync it back to their iCloud, and away they go. Nice. So um, that's been going for three months now, um, and being quite successful. Um, as I say, I might get shouted down. Sounds a bit simple, um, but yeah, it seems to be working. So, so in, be, in between students, it's wiped. Um, that's yeah. right. What, what about, though, I, I guess the one that's different is where you might have a class set, so a PE, te PE faculty might have a group of iPads, and Year 7 are with them now, and there's a couple of iPads in each class being used, and then Year 7 ship out and in walk Year 9, and they've got to use them. How, how, how would you manage that? I think that would be very difficult with those age groups because they're going to be, you know, it's only going to take one kid um, to find, yeah, maybe not a complimentary photo of another child and share it inappropriately, whatever. Um, with the lower grades, with sort of K to 2, um, we're not having those sort of issues because, you know, the kids, they're, they're, you know, they're not at that development stage where they're going to be thinking about doing things like that. So... We do have um, a couple of trolleys, you know, sort of um, class sets of iPads that we use in K to two, um, and they're great. The, our integrator manages the apps that are on them. They're handed out to the kids. They do their little bit of work, and they're handed back. Um, but Ben, I think you're right. Um, sharing those devices without wiping them between sort of middle school ages, um, you're probably going to come up with some problems there. Um, Sue, you're being very quiet. I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just sort of listening because at the moment, well, the school um, isn't very well resourced that I'm working at and we've got laptop trolleys. There's like, you know, some in senior college and some in the um, middle school and there's a few dedicated computer labs, but that's it. And um, they're looking into, yeah, um, looking into the one-to-one -one device just because the resources aren't shared very well at all. Um, a lot of classes miss out on using anything um, and they thought a solution might be to go one-to-one. -one. So I was just curious to hear some of the comments about it, some of the problems and some of the benefits. Yeah. i, I got to say, I'm tempted to look at this whole thing and, and let my left brain sort of go, well, this is, not, you know, this is still too early to say. There's still too much activity is going to happen with uh, hardware over the next couple of years. And I'll oh, stop it. Turn this off. Hang up. Um, and yet, then I see what some schools that have gone down this tablet path, the iPad path, are doing, and I, it just blows me away the sort of stuff that the kids are producing. And as much as people say they're a consumption device, not a production device, the stuff I'm seeing uh. kids doing on iPads is astounding. Um, and it's, I guess, because they've got this thing, it's in their hands, it's got a camera, it's got a microphone, it's easy to use, it plays uh. music, it, it, like it lets them do stuff. And although I don't think it lets them do stuff to the same extent that a, quote, real computer does, the point is they do more of it. Um, has anyone else got any thoughts about that? Chris, have you got some examples when you're saying um, you've been amazed at some of the things they're doing? What, what sort of things do you mean? Oh, look, I was at ISTE a couple of months ago in San Diego and um, I went, there was, there was iPad sessions all over the place. I tell you, Apple wasn't at that event as a sponsor, but they may as well have been because I think... Uh, there was 18,000 delegates there and probably 13,000 of them were carrying iPads. It was amazing. Um, and there were so many sessions and workshops about, you know, iPad this, that and the other. And I went to a couple of them. And there was one I went to of a woman who was a middle school teacher, so years seven and eight, I think it was. And she was just basically, she did, for an hour, she just went and showed example after example after example of the stuff her kids were doing as far as movie making and podcasting and producing e-books and just making stuff. Um, and it was kind of <laughs> eye-opening to just see the sorts of things these kids were doing with what, you know, I, I would have at one point looked at it and said it was a completely anemically underpowered device for doing that sort of stuff. And it's still not high-level stuff. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, there's no, nothing the equivalent of Photoshop or Premiere or all that sort of stuff on it. But maybe you don't need that stuff to just do good stuff. Maybe just simple is better. Because then at least kids then at least kids do it. I don't know, just a thought. I saw two examples um, in Melbourne recently, Chris. Um, one was where uh, 
the kids had sort of a biology, like a plant kind of unit of work to do. And they were sitting at their desk and they had a paper workbook that they had to fill in and they were using the iPad purely to look up stuff, right? They were just on Wikipedia looking up plant biology. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of it for me. That's, um, that's content consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and then another class, they, um, would do, they were doing something with an app called Photo Editor or, or Photo Something. And it was an art class and they were designing masks. They had to design a mask. And, of course, they could go and design, you know, 100 masks on, on this app, which, which kind of turned the whole design, you know, the art design process on, it, on its head. So, again, I'm, I'm a little bit the same as you. I've, I've seen a lot of examples of kids doing stuff on iPads, just not sure whether um, they need those higher-end applications. At the moment, the curriculum people at my school are saying, we need Photoshop, we have to have... Um, those higher-end applications. So, so an iPad has basically been ruled out on that basis. Mm. I find one of the other things with the iPad, with the younger kids in particular, that I've found not with any other device, is that I, I every day get emails from kids in preps in grade one and in grade two, grade three and fours, where they're using either iPods or iPads. They send me their work. Because every app we have, most of them, you can email off your work to somebody. The kids just love sending the teachers. Everyone around the school, they'll send it to the principal. All different people, they'll send you their little bit of work they did. And when you see them in the yard, they're talking about it. And they'll say, oh, did you get that email I sent you? And when I'll say, yeah, because it's on my phone as well, so I can, I've immediately seen it and I haven't had to go away somewhere and find it. And you've got an immediate conversation about their learning, which would never have happened with a laptop. Mm. It would never have happened with a desktop. And this is the type of learning. It brings in the socialness and it just happens every day where kids are talking about their learning that never would have happened before. Yeah, and that's it, the sort of can I argue it, that? From it's a, maybe, it's, maybe it's, it's the high school versus primary school, but I would Probably. say in a, in a, in a laptop... Um, I get exactly the same with laptops. I don't see any difference between that. I don't think lap. I, admittedly, I see a laptop. I I wouldn't want to teach a primary student with a laptop. It'd kill them. Um, but I I don't. I hear the same with laptops. I'm not quite sure. And maybe that's where the research, to me, a lot of it seems to be done in primary schools and the successful implementations done at primary school, because the personalised nature of the device lends itself is safer in that environment. And wonder whether that's maybe the, the challenge here is that we're trying to hack a, a device that just doesn't belong in high schools at the moment. That that could be true. Yeah, and I am definitely talking from a primary point of view and what kids would never have been able to do in a primary school that now they can. Um, but even our grade five sixes who have netbooks, they never email you this stuff yeah, on the netbooks. Uh, they don't. Even, they don't, wouldn't even do it. They wouldn't even attempt to do it. Um, whereas the kids on the iPads, even the grade fours, will quite easily because it's just there's no technology in the way, and they can just click an email from in the app where they've done the work. It's just it's just got technology I, I, out of the way. I can't help thinking that the, the analog to this is, um, you know, the success of something like Instagram. I mean, the idea of sharing photos is not new. We've had Flickr for years. We've had all these other photo sharing mm. services for years. But Instagram took off. And why is that? And, and I think it's like, you know, professional photographers will poo-poo the idea of a camera phone. But people say the best, you know, the best phone, uh, sorry, the best camera is the one you've got with you all the time. And I think it's that nature of it being easy and simple and always there and always on and quick to access and everything else that maybe the, um, the, the uh, underpoweredness of it is actually weighed out by the fact that it's there and it's available. I don't know, just a thought. Yep. Uh, definitely, I think so. And I recently took my camera and my iPhone overseas, thinking I'd better take a real camera to get some really good shots and um, got my camera to take a few shots at different times and um, ended up using my i phone because I decided it was better and then when I really looked into it my iPhone was 8 megapixels and my camera was only 5 so it's a dud I need to get a new camera or something 
But but also yeah. the iPhone. It's it's about took, glass, not pixels. <laughs> took the photo much quicker and everything. Admittedly, in the dark, you know, you, you're not going to go much far with an iPhone. But yeah, it was in my pocket. It was so much easier. It's the convenience. And the connectedness too. Yeah, yeah. What can you do with the photo once you've taken it? Yeah. You've got to bring it home, upload it to a computer, share it. it. Takes time, but if you've got it in your pocket. The camera that is in your pocket, you can share it straight away. So, like you were saying about Instagram, Chris, yeah. um, that's uh, that's our iPods. Well, I, I've seen I, lots of people I've successfully had, so do a connected. Uh, like a 365-day uh, photo challenge, but they've nearly always done it using a like a handheld personal device, an iPhone, or a, or a, you know a, 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 something they carry with them all the time. I know hardly anybody who's done a 365 photo challenge using a, a DS, DSLR. Because right? it's just too damn inconvenient, and I just wonder if that's an analog to the whole. You know, why are these things so successful? Because they're there and they're available and they're easy. I wonder if that's a sort of a part of the, the fact that. One of the difficulties we found in the trial in Victoria with the secondary schools that I can remember them talking about when we had our sort of last meeting was that in in the secondary schools because their students had a variety of teachers. Um, and they knew which teachers would say have something for them or allow them to use the iPads and they knew which teachers wouldn't. You had students either bring them or not bring them on certain days because they knew whether they would be used or not. Whereas in the primary setting where you've basically got the one teacher all the time across all your subjects, it was a lot easier to integrate the use of the iPad um, because it was going to be used um, or, you know, a lot during the day, and there was no on and off sort of switch, like in the secondaries. So that was a, a bit of an issue they had to overcome. And in some schools they may have, and in others they didn't. Are you finding the use model for them becomes uh, the fact that the kids just have them and they can use them at any time, or is it still a matter of the teacher saying, "Okay, now get out your iPads, we're about to do something," or does the teachers do what the teacher normally does and the kids use the technology, um, like? They decide when they need to use the technology, or are they waiting for permission, sort of thing? A bit of both. Yeah. A bit of both, and it would depend on the students, and sometimes depend on the teachers. Okay, so is the success of an iPad program, be it a trial or an actual program? I love the way we always these iPad trials, yeah. like you know, yeah, constantly yeah. trialing stuff. Yeah, we think um, we look up someone else's <laughs> trial. Um, is the success of something like this then dependent on the teacher? Is this another interactive whiteboard scenario where the, in the hands of a, a teacher who knows what to do with this technology, they're really powerful and really useful, but in the hands of, you know, I, I hate to say it, but the average teacher, they're kind of a, wasted? I would say that with every piece of technology, and this is no different. I've right. always believed that. It's the teacher that makes the difference, not mm. the gadget. You can yeah, get a absolutely. teacher who can run the best program in a world with a netbook, same with an iPad, same probably with an Android device. If they are the teacher who is uh, switched on and right into it, they will have an amazing program. Yeah. I, I think that's where we've got to really catch what we want from teaching and learning. And it's really great to talk about the utopia that just says the teacher facilitates learning and the students learn how they want, which would mean some students will be writing, some students will crank out their laptop, some students will crank out their iPad. Um, but the reality of teaching and learning, and for a long time to come, it, it is very teacher centric. Uh, it, it might they might empower the students, but still the, the learning is still very much guided by the teacher. And probably speaks to why the discussion started off in LMS is we were hoping for a solution that would would blend a personalised device with the teacher centric model. Um, and I guess it's it's where I think the real challenge comes in for the implementation of a tablets in schools program is what is your change management and change leadership uh, underpinning processes and structures to actually make sure that you can use these devices to facilitate change in the classroom. And I know from my experience in the one-to-one -one program, um, rather large one, when you actually take it down to the real scale of schools, um, depending on what level and what quality of change management and change leadership will have a, a vast impact on that program. And it's a decision, do we make, do we use iPads as a catalyst for change? And then how do we structure for that? How do we make that a meaningful change process? Because it, it ain't just buying a cart, 30 laptops and handing, this, handing the teacher an iPad and praying to God we'll see change. Um, 
it, it's a much deeper process and, and maybe that's what is needed more in this discussion is less around apps and hardware and more around change management and change leadership to ensure that the investment, because it's, it's big dollars. You know, if you think at 30 iPads, well, 31 if you throw the teacher in the ring, and a, and a MacBook to run the show, a charging cart, apps, um, whatever else you need, a, an Apple TV, etc. You're not talking a few dollars. You're talking, you know, potentially twenty five thousand dollars for a classroom investment. Yes. And at the end of six months, can you see a visible impact of that investment in teaching programs, changing pedagogical structures, quality of teaching and learning, and and visible elements of learning in the classroom and if the only evidence you have is a cart sitting in the corner collecting dust um, then that's a big crap load of coin to have collect sitting in the corner collecting dust and that's quite frightening. Agreed. Yeah one of our um, questions we were always asked with the iPads is oh and um, nap plan how is this made a difference to your nap plan? <laughs> And, and my answer is always the same, that we didn't go into it to make our NAPLAN scores better. It might have been nice. And no, they didn't make a huge in, in, any improvement on our scores at all. Uh, our main goal with taking on the iPad trial was to try and see if we could in some way um, motivate or something the students to be more self-directed in their learning. Because we didn't want them to always just be going off what the teacher was saying, we're going to draw whatever. We wanted the kids to be able to get some control over their learning and to be doing some of their own stuff. And we did see that with the trial. Kids were doing lots of stuff that they'd never done before off their own backs. Um, with the group we have got now, it is a little bit less. And I wonder if that's perhaps because we've been a bit more structured. We've seen a huge difference with the grade three, fours as opposed to the grade five, sixes with the use of the iPads. Um, we've got a different cohort of kids as well, but we still have students who will go away and produce all sorts of stuff in their own time on things we're not even doing at school that is uh, demonstrating their learning and they're still learning with them. So that was one of our aims and I guess we have seen uh, improvement and evidence of that happening with students. And I think that's the important thing is, is it, for any investment is successful to really turn around to, and to all of us, we've got to justify to our bosses. We can do some as much funky stuff as we're in the classroom, but ultimately we, everyone in this circle needs to sit in front of their boss and it's that evidence and that's what I sometimes think is missing is, is actually having concrete evidence like, like Jenny's talking about there that of what changes in students' learning evidence um, and too often a list of apps is perceived as evidence. Here's the 10 apps I'm using in my classroom and that's often what we see and I, I don't mean to sound like that's all that's there, it's just it's regularly what is shown to me as evidence of change and it's like well if a list of apps is evidence of change then I really want to see the student learning, I want to see that, yeah. that's where I, I want to see the change and I guess that's a question I'd like to ask everyone is what data do we want to see? If you had to yeah. collect data on a one-to-one -one implementation, oh, sorry, a tablet implementation, um, and I will be taking notes here because I've got to ask this question in my own head. Um, what data do you want? What data do we want? What data shows us that at the end of the day when we sit down and go, yep, this has worked, or no, let's not do that again? Yeah. A student survey, perhaps student yep. feedback. Yep. So what would you be looking at in the forms? What specific elements of that student survey would you be looking at? Uh, relevance of learning. Yep. But how do you, how do you measure? That, that was my first question too, Ben. I wrote down two pages worth of questions when we first started thinking about this and thought, well, I want some reasonable answers to most of these questions before we get started. And question one was, how do we even measure success? If this is a trial, yep. how do we know it's been worth it? Yeah. That's a, that's a perennial question. I don't know the I answer think, to your uh, question. That's a, that's a perennial problem in education. There's too many factors if you're just measuring a piece of it. So what we've been talking about uh, is a thing called paradata. Um, and paradata is a way of um, uh, getting context on use. Um, uh, it, it's, it's from a different forum, so it's not exactly what you're talking about, but it is about 
um, uh, information on the use of stuff to, in order for us to know or, about its relevance. And this sort of feeds into the big data uh, trends that we're seeing from the US. I'm sure you're all familiar with Rupert Murdoch um, and his claims to change education. Um, he, he did uh, an interesting acquisition a couple of years ago of a group called Wireless Gen. Um, I was in Wireless Gen's offices um, a few times and, um, and also have looked at some of the things that they've, they've produced and um, they are doing a quite incredible analysis of uh, linking uh, small things that students do uh, together to be able to show uh, whether you're, uh, how you're trending as a, as a student, um, but they are highly focused around, uh, and shall we say, NAPLAN um, uh, type activities, so not creative things that you're, you're actually seeing as being beneficial uh, to the, the, the wider learning of students, but this focusing um, on, on measurement means that you tend to uh, value what you can measure. Um, uh, and Paradata is, again, flipping the model to saying, well, what about we just gather and, and are able to look at what people do? It's more like a tag cloud for use of these things. Uh, and therefore gives you a better sense of what gets used for what rather than the big data approach which is trying to say what we'll do is we will gather information about this student and then hammer them in on particular rope pe uh, uh, facilities. Hmm. I can tell people more about Paradata and all that. Problem. <laughs> can, can, I, can I throw a, just something I just thought of then, and I don't know why I thought of this, but I did. Um, a bit of a fuck the world. Um, why don't we prove that iPads improve literacy and numeracy? Because how often are we thrown at from an IT perspective of does it improve literacy and numeracy? Everything is about literacy and numeracy. Nat plan, nat plan, nat plan. And I can see so much literacy and numeracy in, an, in any tablet, it, it's not funny. Um, here, here's a challenge everyone, let's go ahead and prove it. Let's go ahead and run a project that actually gathers some data, see where the kids are at, run a whole project where they're using I, iPads or tablets or Androids, Windows 8 when it finally comes out, don't really care, uh, then post measure them. Because um, I reckon that will be some pretty fascinating data that would be kind of cool to stick on the table that um, I think might scare some people. I'm just going to throw that out there. You're, you're a madman. <laughs> I love it. Though. Um, well, you're, 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 what you have to do is, is establish where they were first, don't you? And 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 we only do that every one to two years on the, the, the national test. Um, I I I think if you want if you want to do that, then um, there is uh, there's a there's a fair amount of. Um, uh, uh, Tried and true programs. I mean, I mean, we've been doing this with literacy and numeracy for a long time. Um, if you if you simply increase the number of hours that somebody is doing something, they will improve at it more yeah. than if they're not. Yeah. Um, and ten thousand uh, makes them an expert. Yeah, yeah that's right. Ten thousand hours. Um, uh, so. Uh, that you could do, and again, I'm, t I'm talking about your, your, your paradata, you know, kind of approach, which is trying to say, if you could say that my evidence is that I got 5,000 more hours of students reading, 7,000 more hours of them doing maths problems than they would have done otherwise across our school, and then uh, it, it, that would be something. Yeah, but, that's an interesting point. I would measure success by the fact that teachers are actually taking, using technology and um, doing something interesting with them because I have such a problem in trying to get teachers to use technology in classes. I just love to see them pick up anything and um, do something creative with it. And the same with the kids, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure sometimes it is measurable. I think, you know, mm -hmm. 
you're starting to sile on on us there, sir. Kids can come up with some great creative things, and I, 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 to me, that's worthwhile rather than measuring success. Oh, I, 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 th I think the picture is coming. The the the, uh, the, uh, the the bits coming across the bass straight there were um, having a bit of trouble. We got bits and pieces of that. I don't know that the goal should necessarily yeah, just know, be to really get bad. teachers using technology, though, because they can use technology badly, and that doesn't really prove anything. But so they need to be using it. Well, and well there the needs other, to be some yeah. student-based outcome, surely. The other two big reasons are always, um, you know, use technology to en engage the kids, um, which is partially related to the fact that they're already there, right? They're using these devices um, every minute, just about of their waking hours outside of school. So we ought, you know, it's it's their tools. It's the things that they want to use. Does, does that justify using technology in the classroom? But is engagement enough? Someone said to me recently, like, well, you go and watch a movie, go to the cinema and watch a movie, you're engaged, but you're not necessarily learn. You're not, uh, what's the word they used? Um, it was Chris Lehman that used it. Um, there's a difference between engagement and, I can't think what the word he used was, but like that next level up where you're not just engaged, but you're actually learning and, and, and taking that engagement oh, sure. and doing something constructive with it. Watching a movie, you, yeah, you're just you're barely more than a vegetable, aren't you? Um, yeah. And we talk about that a lot in schools. I mean, I know, you know, I, I sort of delved into the whole interactive whiteboard thing in a big way when I was trying to research a, about it, you know, and that was the constant thing people would say, oh, you get more engagement. Well, so what? I want more than that. I want, I want something a little bit beyond just engagement, mm -hmm. um, although that's important, obviously. You can't teach disengaged kids. Well, it's hard to. So, yeah, you've got to get them engaged. But then beyond that, what? Isn't that about being creative? That's what I was saying before, that I, I think sometimes um, you can't measure it in the sense of uh, sometimes it's being creative with the technology. You know, I'm happy to see kids being creative with it, um, doing something different with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I had someone I, suggest to me recently that the... the, uh, the yeah, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, making kids problem solvers, um, but really what we should be thinking about maybe more is making them problem identifiers and perhaps putting a tool in their hands that lets them be the problem identifiers to actually go and f spot things that they could do to make the world a better place and giving them a tool in their hands that they have agency over to try and make those changes is a really good thing, but that's, that's a big leap. Yeah, so it, that's taking us into the, the, the realms of um, the uh, well, technical hyperbole we've, we've had for 20 years. Um, uh, the, 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 the issue is going to be that the kids that, that are going to solve the problems uh, and, and identify those things are, are probably going to be the ones that, we, that will do it, whichever device be it, you know, that they've got. Um, what we've uh, so we've got to identify what the target is. I have a question for people that that's uh, perhaps a bit um, off the wall. Um, I, have, I don't know because I haven't used Hangouts that much, where there's a chat window uh, as well, um, uh, so I can put links in it. Um, um, but if you uh, right at the top of the screen, Dan, there's a there's a row of buttons. The one on the far left says chat. If you click that, it'll open up a panel on the left, and you can stick stuff in there. Interesting. Far left. Okay. Okay. Got it. Now, so who, has people here heard of a thing called improve? <laughs> Beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the link above yours. Oh, gosh. That is hilarious. You, you, great yeah, minds right. think alike, Daniel. Great minds think alike. That's it. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so um, this is this is the, I'm working with. This is part of uh, ESA, and NSIP is uh, uh, is attached to ESA, ESA being Education Services Australia. Um, and one of the projects that we're uh, doing at the moment is trying to connect uh, this improved project into schools and jurisdictional systems so that all of the setup of all the quizzes and accounts and recording of students results are, are then linked back into the, the, the system because 
we find we, if you've got a, another 30 accounts that the teacher has to set up on another uh, you know, platform out there, that's a bit of an issue. Yeah. Um, and the issue between a personalized device and being able to personalize the learning is that the identity has to persist across those different environments. Right, so that the information that happens in one, I want a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, and this is a long way of saying, this, in, this, in, this improved tool is, if you like, part of a vanguard of a whole range of products that is going coming out from the federal government um, around NAPLAN online and around um, how do we move uh, NAPLAN testing from a once every two years to an easily accessible tool for teachers to throw their kids in and say, look, I just want to see how you're doing in this area of maths, etc. And that be linked into the Australian curriculum. So what we're doing is we're mapping content to the Australian curriculum, we're mapping tests to the Australian curriculum, and we're making it so that you can effectively traverse content and tests to uh, have things that are, are, are relevant put in front of people. And why is that interesting? Because it means that we're able to uh, provide, and this isn't a tablets question, it, it, but it is, it, it's, it's a, but it is, it, they're part of the ecosystem because um, if you're more able to do it and m much more easily able to get onto it and more able to do it more often, then well, ipso facto, you probably get better off and you could put the students in to improve to start with and then test them at the end <laughs> by improve and show a change. It, it's actually what we've, we've been doing with some other literacy programs that are more traditional. And it's, um, I'm just actually thinking about how we could actually use this to justify uh, investment or prove that investment isn't worth it for iPads, well, hopefully justify. Um, or any tablet, but I think it's it's the important thing is actually that pre and post test to actually provide evidence, uh, hard data that says, yep, this has a benefit in the class. This actually benefits students because um, that's where I really want to see. You know, if I'm if I'm dropping twenty five thousand dollars in the classroom, I want those students to see twenty five thousand dollars worth of learning out of it. Uh, and there's the engagement point is is critical, um, but if it's just making movies about what they did on the weekend. Um, then I think it's it's fairly vaporous. Whereas what we really want to see is we want to use that that tool of making movies to access literacy in new new ways, uh, access learning in new ways, and engage deeply in in not just content but deeply in just learning in general um, for improved outcomes across the board for all students. And and I guess that's the the challenge we get. And without that, then really we we're, we're not going to achieve anything. We're just going to spend a lot of money. It's interesting when we started this chat, I had all these ideas in my head that we'd probably talk about things like, oh, how, how do you deal with not having Flash and how do you deal with not having an easily shared device and <laughs> all those sorts of things. And this discussion has just gone so much higher level than all that sort of basic stuff and it's really reminded me how important that is. I blame Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Too far, we'll blame too Daniel. Far. But it's true, though. I mean, people. Whenever I get involved in discussions about this with 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 people, it always comes down to what apps do you think are useful, or what uh, you know. How do you deal with not having Flash, or you know, you know, Google Docs don't work very nicely on an iPad. So what do you do about that? that all those kind of real nuts and bolts kind of questions, and they're all important. Chris, you get an Android. Like this discussion is taking it to another level. Yeah, that's an issue for us. I've got to say because we're looking at iPads, but. No, we're a Google Docs school, and I know yeah. that one's going to suffer because of the other. Yeah, putting that auto Apple is going to hurt inside. I can assure you, there'll be a, there'll be a, there'll be a brain tear that will shed when I place that order. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not surprised if we go the same way. Anyway, um, I noticed a thing that we have had with our our students in that. Um, the learning is happening and we're doing this and your job is to do that and the students decide the apps they're going to use. They're not told, okay, we're all going to use Keynote or something and you've got to produce something. It's while well, we're learning about multiplication. Um, you, you people can see what you can produce on your iPads for that concept or whatever and they'll choose various apps and come up with a, with a totally different production of what they've been uh, doing about that concept, and that's 
that's what we how we like them to be used rather than so the kids actually choose what they're yeah. doing. Yeah, I and like that model. Um, the thing I really liked about them being student managed when we had our five six of student managing it, the teacher might say, "Now next week we're going to have a bit of a focus on say fractions or something," and um, the kids would go home and search in iTunes for apps on fractions. So it wasn't these are the apps you'll need next week. We, we, we might be focusing on fractions next week. Can you go away and see what is available in the app store? Come back and see if there's, tell us if there's anything good. And kids would go away and find the app that suited them and suited their learning. And they would come back and say, I like this one because of this, this, and this. So when we were doing a focus on fractions, there may, may have been four or five different apps being used in the classroom by different students for their different learning styles. So I really like the way that it did personalise to their type of learning. And because the students could um, self-direct themselves, it was very powerful, something we hadn't seen before. Yeah, and the students felt that power as well. Um, but you need to have a really trusted environment to have that and have a lot of trust between your students and teachers. And I imagine if you've got teachers who are, um, shall we say, control freaks, that that's not going to work as well. <laughs> yes, that's right. And if you've got students who aren't very motivated as well, they might do nothing, so yeah. you know you've got to um, have have a balance and yeah, mm. doesn't happen um, overnight. I'm We've been chatting for probably just over an hour, and I'm mindful that this is a conversation that could go on for a long time, and I don't want to hold you guys to that. But um, what say it's nine twelve now? What do you think we go for another sort of ten fifteen minutes and then wind it up? You okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Jenny, um, just a, a question. Um, sort of related to what you're just talking about. How have you gone with, um, you know, like a teacher sets an assignment or something and and basically leave, leaves it open to the students to uh, submit the work in various different formats, whatever they prefer? Um, have you sort of come across that and, and how are your teachers coping with that? Are, are they fine in terms of, you know, assessing different, I guess, um, do you know what I'm getting at? Different types yeah. of work that the people are submitting. So the so the task becomes yes. about the the verb, not the noun. It becomes about presenting an idea rather than making a PowerPoint. Yep. Yes. Um. Uh. We don't. I guess in primary we're not as big on marking like in secondary mm. where you have to give an a mark and they get this mark and it adds on and it all adds up for their score. So ours ours are more students will create stuff and present it to the class and, and you know we'll all look at it or whatever at some form or another at, at different times and that is more how it's handled so it's not sort of collecting all the students work and then trying to work out how we'll mark them all and get the same sort of a mark or a marking system when they use different apps for instance yep. so um, and I guess it would be more based on the concept whether they push the concept or not and how well they push the concept and not really looking at the app or what the page looks like or the colours or anything yeah, when it comes down to it. Mm. Have they been they may, able to yeah. push across have the they, concept? Have they effectively persuaded an audience or have they effectively yeah. communicated an idea? Yeah, or no. has it been all whiz-bang and nothing about the concept? Yeah. Because that can happen. And again, yes. it comes down to teachers taking their hands off a little bit and, and not insisting that things be done a certain way, but rather insisting that certain outcomes be reached. Yeah, and, um, and it doesn't suit all students. Some students can be more self-directed than others. Others need to get there slowly and be guided along the way and gradually the release be, be let go, whereas others will like to be like it from the start. So... You know, you can't do what one thing for everybody. Mm. Yeah. And that's that's what I would say with an iPad or a one to one device rollout. It's um many to one, many different forms of use to one gadget in your school. The the one to one is, is, you know, really hard for everyone to be doing exactly the same and having the same amount of privileges with their gadget as others. You know, there's so many different things that will come into it. Yeah. And um, with iPads, for instance, you've got all sorts of different things happening with families, with siblings, with parents, with visiting 
parents where they don't always live. You've got lots of things happening that will come into play. Speaking of that, I mean, just in terms of, again, just some nuts and bolts stuff, I mean, uh, I will happily admit I work in a school that's a little more um, fortunate than some others, and so I realise I'm in a slightly different position. But, I mean, I can walk into most of our classes and say to the kids, oh, hands up if you've got an iPad at home, and like half the class put their hands up. And I know it's not like that everywhere, but what happens in instances when you get um, a lot of kids who already own the device at home I mean, should schools be looking at, do you think, rather than um, figuring out how to fund sets of iPads in a class situ situation, rather than looking at how do we leverage what we've already got? And I know, Mike, you'd I probably guess. be in a similar situation, right? Yeah, look, and that's that's very much um, the focus I want to take next year. I mean, I mean, school, yeah, our school, obviously, again, is quite privileged, quite well-resourced. So we want to keep going with the the school-owned, you know, device program. Um, but, yeah, we definitely, you know, we definitely want to support kids who want to bring an iPad in from home as a secondary device. Um, and we're already seeing kids doing that. They've, they've, yeah. they've got a MacBook and an iPad and they're walking around the school with both devices so they can do the high-end stuff on the MacBook, but if they just want to look something up or check their email, they'll just pull the iPad out. The flip side of that would be kids who don't want to use it. So my daughter has uh, an iPad, loves it for checking Facebook and doing all that sort of stuff. But if, if I said to her, we're going to put some of your textbooks on here or we're going to let you use it for school, uh, she'd be horrified and go, no way, not interested, mm. don't want to do it. Mm. So I think there's, there's a flip side to that argument as well. Definitely. Uh I think you've also got to think about that not all your students are privileged too. There are also many students that are at your schools through various means that... Sure doesn't totally. mean there's a big fat piggy bank at home no, um, and, and what is the hidden curriculum for them and I think that's one of the great equity of a one-to-one -one program whatever the device is um, because it sends a clear message that everyone's equal it doesn't matter who you are because um, even probably on the other end of the spectrum to both your schools we still have a number of, we do have students with iPads um, and I think we're starting to see them increasingly that there, there are students with iPads. Um, I always laugh that I always seem to be on YouTube even though it's blocked, but we won't go there. Um, but so they've it, got 3G iPads. 3G, they? yeah, definitely 3G. Yeah, we won't go there. Um, um, but what is the hidden curriculum when I say when when we enable and says you know look, bring your own device or technology or whatever the word of the month is for this. Um, but I think that we've really got to be careful that that sends a really strong message to our school communities and is that a positive message and, and what do we want to grow from that? Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a balance behind that and it's probably, a, that challenge is probably a little bit easier for you uh, and I have seen programs run in schools where there's a school offered technology alternative um, that's a bit like the school offered uniform. Um, where everyone gets a nice new uniform except for the poor kid that can't afford it and he gets the t-shirt and tracksuit pants um, and, it, and that, that, I guess that's just one of the challenges we need to sort of work through on this and I'm, I'm not saying I've got the solution, I'm just pointing out something that's important to me it is a challenge and it's for all our systems, it's really easy to say it's for the more challenging context it's our problem but I do know as, as you do there are a number of students that attend uh, even the more affluent, the most of affluent schools that are there on scholarships or grandma's paying or, or they've got sure. mum and dad working jobs 24-7 purely to pay the school bills yep. and at the end of the week there is very little money left over and there certainly ain't money for an iPad and, and that's a pretty tough experience for them to go through and, and whether whether the BYOT or BYD or whatever word of the month is uh, facilitates their learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry everybody. <laughs> Yeah, no, good point, Ben. Really good point. We had, we had a lady, I had a lady at a parent breakfast just recently who, um, who yeah, basically voiced that same sentiment. You know, that's all very well for some of these kids, but boy, we're struggling with these fees and, and there's not going to be no iPad from home. And um, yeah, basically had to assure that lady that, um, that we're sticking with the school program. You know, obviously we can't stop kids from bringing things into school. Um, but it's something, I guess, that the teachers have to monitor in the class as well. If, if they're saying, well, okay, kids, pull out your iPad from home, that's, that's going to be a big issue. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, we have a, a very high percentage of our students on low incomes. So um, we, um, well, we have some students have their own iPads, but they're mainly um, autistic students who have been funded with an iPad from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a majority of our students are low income families and um, sometimes it's interesting the things they do have um, because they tend to have some things that um, some more well off families may not have so but uh, generally as a whole they, they wouldn't be running out to buy their own devices. Do you think, I, I guess it's kind of a side issue, but do you think um I mean, and clearly the prices of these things are dropping. I just ordered myself a Galaxy Nexus yesterday and it was like 299 bucks versus, you know, whatever the cheapest iPad is, is about 500 and 400 For the iPad 2? Yeah. Yeah, for 437 or something, or whatever, whatever it is. But, I mean, I, I, the, the trend is clearly downwards in price. Um, and yeah. the rumours about Apple releasing this iPad mini or whatever it's going to be called... You know, you would think that that has to be a, um, you know, a response to these cheaper tablets, which now the quality of some of these Android tablets now, there was, you know, go back 12 months or two years ago, you know, and it was a laughable comparison, but now it's pretty damn equitable. Some of this new Jelly Bean stuff coming out is easily comparable to an iPad. Um, and I just wonder if Apple's going to start competing then on price, which I've never had to do before, and then whether that's just going to end. We're going to go for the race to the bottom now on price. Comparable? I, I say superior. <laughs> I knew you would. I was saying before you joined the conversation, my boss turned up uh, this morning, Ben, with he just got back from Singapore, and he picked up two uh, Samsung Note 10.1s. And they, they are. A, you've just thrown in the, the chat there. Yeah, they are a very sweet piece of hardware. They very look sweet. Really, piece. really, really good. Yeah, yeah. I have the the old um, Lenovo with a stylus, and where the stylus actually integrated with the hardware on the on the touch sensitivity. Samsung yeah. Note 10.1 has done it even better. This was the the Lenovo was the first effort at it, and it. I know. I know you've got on other tablets, Android, and you have the the stylus, but when you've actually got the stylus integrated with the hardware, where the hardware actually, uh, I think the Lenovo is 132 points of sensitivity, uh, and I think the, the Samsung Note is a, is 500 or something, I've got to get the stats on it. Yeah. Um, but well, I think the, even, even you, the most rabid open Android fan, would have to admit that the Android tablets of the previous couple of years really haven't been oh, comparable. Definitely. They, they, it's always been hackerware. Yeah, you had to have a level of skill. It's only really since um, Ice Cream Sandwich in end of last year came out that it actually entered the realm of usable uh, yeah. in, in any form. You did need certain skills. Um, now it's just out of this world, like particularly with with ice cream sandwich, uh, and the new jelly bean, uh, and what's coming. Um, and there is some school education. There is some cool education stuff that they're playing with. Um, it's certainly come on, yeah. you know, well within realms. Um, I know Lynette James Seven um, on Twitter. Her school has just gone a, an Android program. Um, yeah. So they've bought a whole heap of Android tablets. So I'm, I'm interested to see what comes out of that. And for education, the big bonus is the number of free apps is certainly superior. Um, there are a lot more free apps available, but they do come with advertising. That's always the catch with Android. Yeah. It, it, the, the free apps are sponsored by advertising, but in, in certain ways, I mean, if, if it's a way, it's a, it's a means to an end, it's, you know, it's got to be done. Yeah. I mean, Jenny makes a point in the chat there, uh, and as Jenny will probably jump in on this, about, you know, put them in the hands of prep and then make the comparison. And maybe the iPad still is a superior device at that age group. I don't know. Yeah, I, I actually think um, it, it's still not the, the device. And um, you, you get your load of uh, Android tablets and you'll run it and you'll have a great program. Okay, yep. so it's not the gadget. You know, you've got to get off it. If your your teachers happen to really like a certain gadget and they go for it, great. It's no good running a thing and they all hate the gadget. Sure. Because they're not going to be into but it. But I mean, but I mean, you you put as you put in the chat there and put it in the hands of the preps and we'll compare. And I mean, obviously you you do see that there are some advantages of iPads over anything else in that age group. So you know, to some extent, maybe it's partly the the device. 
No? Well, I do like technology not being a blocker. I've seen technology for too many years being a blocker. Um, yeah. I've seen technology become a blocker compared to what it used to be. A typical example of that is um, iWeb. We used to do our student portfolios using iWeb mm -hmm. and um, kids made absolutely great uh, websites. Mind you, it wasn't on the internet so it wasn't published. But they could so easily build up stuff and give evidence of their learning and now we've got the ultranet and for them to do the same thing, they could do, you know, take them two hours to do something that took 15 minutes and that's where technology has just got in the way mm -hmm. and I don't like it. I think, I think really it's, it's also not so much a blocker. What iPad does have that Android doesn't is documentation because there's been so many teachers playing with it because they did come to the market with a more usable product first. Um, there is some amazing documentation. There are for every challenge you face when, with implementing an iPad program, there is a blog filled with hips, tin, hips um, tips, tricks and whatever to get around that problem. There are lists of apps, so the the innovation curve. I don't believe the hardware is any more innovative. In fact, it's stolen from Samsung, but we won't go there. Um, is any more innovative? But the actual information that allows the layperson to innovate is certainly much more there. And I, I like I've had to talk to my executive recently, and my my say, oh, I'm an Android all the way. But I was quite clear: if if you haven't played in this space yet, start with Apple, mm. because it, I think they're both comparatively ease of use now, not a few years, a few months ago, but now they are comparatively ease of use. But the, the one, the edge iPad has is, is documentation. It is so easy. If you want to do it, there's the stuff there how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, I guess that's the big edge. And um, my hope is over time, Android overcomes that and we do get a level playing field. And I, I'm not quite sure if anyone's playing with Windows 8 at the moment, um, but certainly something to keep 